This is a recording of papers given at the conference on the 7th of November, 1981, organized by the Scottish Georgian Society and the Department of Extramural Studies of the University of Edinburgh, with the support of the Scottish Church's Architectural Heritage Trust. Third, Mr. Larry Rowland, architect, chairman of the Church of Scotland Advisory Committee on Artistic Matters. I found the, the title of a conservation crisis uh, stimulating. I felt it almost sounded like the title of a thriller, you know, uh, a race against decay, um, a tale of woe or hope, uh, priorities or principles. And I began to build on this and thought, thought of the five main characters involved. Um, an architect, uh, the corporate Royal Corporation, um, a general trustee of the Church of Scotland, and then a country elder in the parish church, and fifth one, uh, the chairman of the advisory committee. These I saw as the protagonists, uh, and of course in any plot there are the uh, standard characters, the lover, the innocent, the nurse, the manipulator, and the baddie. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about each of these characters from different uh, viewpoints, and you can label them as you think best. First, the architect, um, a man of skill with a real and deep understanding of buildings. I don't know if that sounds sarcastic or, or genuine. <laughs> the only man who is trained in all aspects of building, the person best suited to give advice about proper maintenance and conservation of our churches, he understands the implications, aesthetic, technical, financial, and social. Or is he really rather a vague idealist with his head in the clouds, pushing unrealistic restoration. Or again, perhaps that frightfully competent technical dullard who batters our buildings to bits with sound detailing. Or do I hear some of you whisper he isn't any of these things, he's just incompetent to us. <laughs> well, anyway, for my money, the uh, architect, as you might imagine, is going to be the lover in this piece. He certainly, as Ian said, he's the man who cares. Um, now, what about the corporate uh, character of the profession, the RIS or the RIBA? Its ideals are, of course, of the very best, and uh, I think he must uh, take the place of the innocent. Uh, I would like to read you the um, extract from the RIBA Royal Charter of 1837. It, it makes good reading, 150 years old nearly. It uh, talks about the um, RIBA standing for the General Advancement of civil architecture and for promoting and facilitating the acquirement of the knowledge of the various arts and sciences connected therewith. <coughs> Definitely uh, for architecture before architects. And if not the innocent, then he's certainly frightfully above board. I think therefore it's clear that the RIS and the RIB exist only to promote quality in building and the RIS can and does help by its professional structure and educational system, endeavoring to produce men of skill that the public can trust. Is this the correct picture, or are they in fact a rather heavy-handed, pompous lot, protecting their own, eager for work, especially just now, keeping their charges high to protect their members, and holding back more enlightened, enthusiastic, talented young men with professional red tape. Getting in the way of it and not really doing an awful lot of good. I don't think so, but I've put both sides to you. Now then, what of our uh, country elder? I'm afraid I have him down as the baddie. I'm sorry. I don't know how many elders are here, but uh, I'm one too. He should be uh, one of the lay leaders of the congregation, a member of the Kirk Session and the Presbytery, bringing to bear his own personal skill and talent within the, this democratic organization, which is the Church of Scotland, carrying out a faithful stewardship and sensibly uh, helping to conserve the buildings he loves. He serves, of course, on the Fabric Committee and the Presbytery Fabric Committee, and he sees that the annual inspection of buildings is dutifully carried out and pays particular attention uh, to the now mandatory arrangements surrounding the quinquennial visits. 
but actually perhaps he's a rather tired businessman, untrained in such matters of buildings, and with enough problems with his own house. <laughs> he is a professing Christian who tries in his own somewhat nervous way to assist the minister in his job, but frankly buildings are often a bit of a nuisance. Expensive, old, difficult to maintain, and definitely for his money a liability. Now the fourth character, the uh, uh, general trustee. I should say that the trustees, a group of about 37 men, ministers and elders, are charged with the job of uh, looking after the church's incredibly fine heritage of buildings. He may be on one or two of uh, five committees, chairman's committee, finance, reeds, fabric, or law. But remember the church's function it is, of course, to spread the word of God, to save souls. Now, uh, while you might choose to be saved in a beautiful, warm church, uh, what happens if the trustees are short of money and they have to pick their priorities between artistic and practical? What happens, in fact, if you can choose to be saved in a beautiful church or a warm church? The trustee's job, if convinced, is to lead the assembly towards a sensible and proper maintenance of its buildings. But I say, if convinced, is it really convinced? Do they see the need for planned, enlightened maintenance at a high enough level to avoid aesthetic deterioration as well as fabric deterioration for buildings? I think we must call the trustees the manipulators. Lastly, I come to the um, chairman of the advisory committee on artistic matters, definitely the hero. <laughs> The advisory committee is one of the assembly's committees of ministers and architects whose specific function it is to advise on artistic matters relating to church buildings. It is a well-balanced committee of uh, architects who understand buildings and ministers who understand the reason for having these buildings. It is a dedicated band giving free advice and its committee structure is designed to free them from the other complex considerations which inevitably face the trustees. I, I think they must be classed as the, the nurse in my uh, five characters, um, and I think they do. But uh, you might think, or you might ask, do they really help? Do you think it's yet another woolly, impractical group with not enough power to be effective and therefore not enough strength within it? Does it merely go through the motions of nodding and shaking its head at applications which come before them? Well, I, I think not, of course, and I think that they do a lot of good. Well, there we are a somewhat flippant look at those involved directly and indirectly in the process of conservation and maintenance. Flippant, but I think there's a lot of truth in, in what I say. Well, I suppose it's bound to be because I've, I've covered all points of view. But my task today is to um, explain to you uh, the professional help and advice which is available towards maintenance repair. And uh, I will be uh, inevitably, I think, repeating uh, some of what James and Ian have said. I'm glad to find that we do think largely in the same way, but with differences. I'd like to talk about the kind of help that is available, and the sort of help, I think, which could be available, could be achieved, without asking any of these characters I've referred to, to change their attitudes too much. But may I stress and come back to the fact that I believe that to be effective in our conservation, we must understand these characters, um, and the problems that face them and their attitudes. I think Colin said uh, this morning that we must bring various views together and various parts of the uh, structure of the, the church together so that we can understand. We have an outstanding heritage of buildings, but it is going to require a vast amount of money to maintain them and absolutely more than we're going to be able to get. And this does cause a great deal of real worry and hardship and argument over priorities. I want to suggest a slight change of tack might be appropriate. And I think it does follow the kind of thinking that's emerging from the Royal Corporation and the Advisory Committee policy. My advice is that we should perhaps talk a little less about conservation as a means of retaining something which is increasingly difficult to maintain and talk more about enlightened maintenance as a method 
which if properly handled will make it manageable for us to retain uh, some things of great value so that they do not become impossible burdens. In uh, Ian's uh, grant system, um, this would fall into place. It would tend to uh, uh, show that um, where enlightened maintenance left off, uh, grants would step in. And where more than maintenance is required for buildings, uh, such as in the major national important buildings. We must always start off, I think, by talking about uh, the good sense of wise maintenance. This is uh, clearly uh, not appreciated enough, I think, by uh, the uh, owners of the churches and the elders and the people using them. And I think there are three levels that I would like to, to illustrate. It seems to me very much easier to explain to the average uh, member of the church that if he uh, does some pointing on a parapet now at a cost of a few hundred, he can almost certainly guarantee that he will not have dry rot in the roof lying below and behind, which might cost a hundred thousand in another five years. And having made that point, it is relatively easy and relatively inexpensive to advise him to do the pointing in a sympathetic way to preserve the quality of the stone in the building for very little extra cost. Now that kind of uh, example, uh, these are the easy ones. Then we must consider the nationally important buildings, buildings of great uh, quality uh, and importance in our townscape, like St. Stephen's. This, I believe, is a, a responsibility uh, of government and of uh, Historic Buildings Council. These buildings are uh, to be continued for the use of the community. And we must, again, pick our priorities in these buildings and be selective. The third category, I think, is the one that worries me most, because I think it has, tends to be rather ignored. It's the sort of alteration in a church uh, involving aesthetic considerations only and not particularly necessarily related to maintenance. And I think it tends at the moment to fall between three stools. I remember a few years ago visiting St. Mona's Church with its unique but somewhat arctic setting at the end of the fourth. <coughs> and I was trying to persuade them not to spread large orange cables uh, all over the internal walls, following the mouldings and indeed some cases cutting through the mouldings, to allow them to mount uh, electric uh, wall heaters. They could not raise any more money for heating their church. And I had to try and persuade them that they should uh, either raise more money or wear thermal underwear on a Sunday, or have an industrial heater wheeled in and out before and after the service. Well, of course, they listened politely, but how could you blame them from thinking that this was a, a, an eccentric and unbalanced point of view? The purpose of the building was to worship God. The building was too cold for people to tolerate. The congregation was diminishing. I believe that there should be some financial help in these cases, and it may be that this is the kind of encouraging top-up that could come from SCAT. Now, I'd like to relate these thoughts specifically to answer the call in the paper to tell you the help coming from RIS and APAM. RIS does and must continue to encourage the best architects and maintain its role of defending quality in building. At the moment, specifically, after a request from the General Trustees of the Church of Scotland, and as James has touched upon, they have compiled lists of suitably qualified and interested architects who are prepared and keen to undertake proper maintenance and maintenance reports in churches. There is now a list based on a geographical basis covering the whole country. This uh, completed list uh, was discussed uh, as recently as yesterday, I believe, uh, at the church with a meeting between the Secretary of the General Trustees and the current President of the Royal Corporation. The profession must convince the trustees 
and through them the presbyteries and the local congregations that architects, more than any other profession, are the people best suited to undertake this work, and that their training makes them best suited. Other professions and people can help in specialized ways and can be excellent, but only the architect can take the overall balanced view. Only he can understand the true meaning of enlightened maintenance. What else is the Royal Corporation doing? Well, it uh, is currently preparing uh, a specifically designed report system for church maintenance, something which is detailed enough without being too elaborate or too costly, something which guides the congregations towards an order of priorities, a document which can allow for phased and continuous maintenance. It also seeks to simplify and reduce the charges involved in preparing these reports by collaborating with the church and presbyteries in devising ways of grouping reports and saving on travelling expenses and perhaps more important, travelling time. In addition, the Royal Corporation will help to organise the sort of courses to which James referred to train architects and others, perhaps even ministers, in the economic production of maintenance reports. It can broaden the interest in this field of work and can continue to educate its members so that they can better serve the public. The RIS is adamant, however, that the church and the general trustees cannot sensibly resist these improved quinquennial reports because of the reason that they are afraid that the reports will unearth more problems than they can cope with. And that is, I'm sorry to say, still a strong view held within the church. It just does not help to bury one's head in the sand, but it does help to save nine stitches by acting in time. And I believe that uh, architects can save money and do, by and large, get it right. Now, the advisory committee, a brief uh, history of that, the group was set up in 1934 as a committee of assembly. It is independent and it does have considerable power. Congregations are urged to consult the advisory committee whenever they contemplate alterations, but congregations dealing with buildings prior to 1840 are obliged to do so. I don't know if they're obliged to take their advice, but they're obliged to listen. There are 18 members, uh, 10 ministers and eight architects. We dealt last year with about 180 cases and we also, when notified, advise on all cases of union and readjustments involving redundancy or closure of a building. We now comment on all Historic Building Council grant applications, and we have a subcommittee giving advice on organs. We have and maintain a list of artists and craftsmen, and will advise people on selection of craftsmen for work within churches. There is, of course, a preparation, a preparation, a register of churches throughout Scotland. And we are now building up a presbytery-based panel of archaeologists prepared to advise during building operations. At last year's assembly, we promoted and uh, were successful uh, in gaining approval for the establishment of a store to save good, redundant church furniture. Mm -hmm. And we hope that this will become a reality within the next 12 months. We give advice on all cases put before us and frequently send people or teams to visit local congregations. They're all free and all backed by enormous enthusiasm. Our experience leads us to realize the vital importance of good and prompt and continuing maintenance. And we urge the general trustees to realize that artistic matters arise not only when structural alterations are involved, which is the kind of unofficial uh, definition within the trustees of, of when things become important. Is it a structural alteration? Better have a look at it. If it's not structural, it's minor. And of course, you can understand that that is quite uh, misleading. The installation of the electric wall heaters at St. Monans was not a structural alteration, but it ruined the interior. The rehirling of King's Barnes Church was routine maintenance, but of vital importance not only to the well-being of that building, but to the village in King's Barnes. The advisory committee is also urging the trustees to move towards an acceptance of the uh, quinquennial reports being carried out and supervised by architects. 
or other suitably qualified people. This is not yet uh, a fact, uh, and one has to hope that it will become so soon, though I fear it is certainly not to be a reality within the next year or two. Even if it does take a few years to achieve, we will continue to press for higher standards in reporting and continue to emphasize the practical nature of this belief that only by proper skilled maintenance can the enormous challenge of clearing for our buildings be realistically achieved. To summarize, and as a footnote, I think we must be careful uh, what we conserve. I worry sometimes when I see large sums of money being spent on undoubtedly fine buildings, but buildings which are practically redundant. I accept Ian Begg's plan of the layers of responsibility. Uh, we see that HBC would spend uh, money on the nationally important buildings, but I just want people to think a little bit about the relative merits of spending a lot of money on a Georgian gem which has no longer any practical use, and giving a little assistance uh, to a case like St. Monans, which is also a vitally important building and really only needs a few hundred pounds to persuade the congregation to do something better than trail these walls with cables. As I say, perhaps it's a job for SCAT. I believe that we'll gain more support from the public if we um, show them that we are thinking about orders of priorities. I believe also we must emphasize the practical nature of any conservation which we undertake so that people will understand. The profession, too, must consider this. Highest standards, yes, but they must be attainable. If reports are too detailed and cost too much to prepare, no one will buy us and they'll not be acceptable to congregations. If the advisory committee's views are too blinkered and too idealistic, we will achieve less. The best can sometimes be the enemy of the good, but on the other hand, the good must never be second best. I passionately believe that conservation and proper maintenance is one of the simplest but most important lessons that any building owner can learn, and my efforts lie in convincing architects, elders, trustees, just that simple lesson. Thank you.